second round to our third colloquium event of the semester. Um, Brian is a, a, an associate professor in science education at Stanford University, where he studies um, how language and identity impact urban students' learning. In 2007, he won the NARST Award for Outstanding Early Career Scholarship, having developed the disaggregate teaching approach to improve learning among underserved populations. And right now, he's exploring conceptual continuities between students' formal and infor informal science learning experiences. And it's only because he has to rush off for another talk after this one that I'm going to cut this introduction short. And welcome, Brian. I have to uh, apologize for a shorter than normal lecture, which is uh, usually not a bad thing. I double book. I have a 6.30 lecture uh, back in Palo Alto, so I will be brief. Uh, hopefully effective. Hopefully effective. Well, so, so the title of the talk is uh, The Language Identity Dilemma. So what I want to do today is kind of introduce the, the primary concept, uh, the, the theory behind the work, and then introduce you to two micro studies. These are very, very small studies that are, that are purely um, exploratory, right? And so I, I want to start with the premise, and, and that premise is that there is a, a power, right? Uh, I'm going to call you a, a bad word today. Ladies and gentlemen, you are prejudiced, right? The power of prejudice. And I don't mean prejudice in a pejorative sense. Um, prejudice in, in the very definition of the word, we prejudge. And that is to say, when we see a person, we have a fundamental expectation for what they should sound like, what words they should use, what tone and pitch they should use. So if a, a person is six foot eight, uh, and, and muscular, we certainly expect the, the tone of voice to reflect the size of the individual, right? This is by nature prejudice, right? Um, for, the, for the people who are cognitive scientists in the room, it's just scheme of theory, right? There's a, a pure expectation for what should happen next. Now, language is one of those pieces of information that cues who an individual is. And the tacit nature of us as learners allows us to, to capitalize on that. So what we learn is that part of who we are is embedded in how we choose to communicate. We can communicate who we are, tone of voice, pace, intonation, and what words we use. Right? Very simple idea. But it's rooted in prejudice. So ultimately, I'm making one fundamental argument, and that argument is that language is a tool for cueing who I am. But inversely, it's also a tool for recognizing who people are. And so in, in thinking about this notion of identity, language is a primary feature in both interpreting who we expect people to be and also intentionally marking ourselves as particular types of people. I'd like to give you an example. Maybe not. Okay, we'll start with this. Uh, this is not news. This is something that is well documented in linguistic research. Right, so linguists, linguists understand this principle. Um, Jeffrey Nunberg, uh, he coined the phrase the full bubble phenomenon. And it's the idea that, that uh, politicians will literally hire someone to help them endear themselves to the public. So you don't want to sound uh, overtly academic because then you're an elitist, right? You don't want to sound uh, anti-intellectual because you're not smart enough to be president. And so they hire linguists to help them. And Jeffrey Nunberg, this notion of full bubble comes from Bill Clinton, whose nickname is Bubba, he was the first person to be documented as really spending time identifying himself as a particular type of person, right? So the, the idea is that politicians are quite aware of this. Now, um, the second one of my favorite scholars, Michael Agar, he, he talks about the culture of language. And so Michael Agar says there's two things, language culture. And language culture is uh, a very simple idea, is that understanding the words does not enable you to become part of the, the community of the people, right? Understanding the words is just the entree. Right? If I'm going to truly become a member of a particular community of people, I have to understand what it means to use those words in a particular context. Right? That is to say, true fluency comes when I can use the language and know how to use the language and know what it means to use, that, to use those languages. So every language has a culture, culture, thus this notion of language culture. Conversely, there are then moments in culture that allow me to recognize that I'm either from this culture or I'm not a part of that culture. If I hear someone I get a chance to live over different places in the U.S., if I hear someone say, uh, oh, it's hella cold outside, I smile. All right? I'm from Oakland, California, and if you say hella, you're one of my people. Right? It is a, is it a marker of cultural position. Right? So these are rich points. Um, I lived in Michigan for a while, and people say, well, I'm from Traverse City. Anybody know about this? Translate. What, what am I doing? 
So it's a map, right? The map of Michigan, and people will point to where they are, right? I was completely baffled by that action. What are you doing? But it, it's a rich point. It's a point in which I understand I am not a member of this particular culture, right? So where this becomes interesting for my, my area of interest in research and education, particularly in education in urban context, is how race has played out through language culture, right? Um, there, there's, there's a simple idea. Um, <clears throat> Joshua Fishman talks about when ethnicity and race become distinctively different. That is to say, people who look alike, right, who people who are from similar regions of the world can be from different cultures. And one of the demarking features of the particular cultural places is how those people choose to maintain language as a source of pride. That is to say, I can be from Boston and be from New York. I'm using a bad example because I don't want to get too deep here. But I can speak differently as a way to maintain cultural heritage. The problem, according to Joshua Fishman, is we begin, when we begin to rank these cultural features as more important, more valuable, and, and, or less important and less valuable, that's when we get into racism, right? The idea that when we use language, it can be a great source of pride. I can sound like I'm from Oakland and say, it's hella warm in this room, right? I can be happy about that. It enables me to be a part of my culture. Conversely, if someone is to judge my use of that language as anti-intellectual and, and not appropriate, then we have what, what Fishman talks about is racism. All right, so Signithia Fordham, to me, offered a, probably the, the seminal piece in this kind of uh, linguistic research on language and cultural norms, and she studied a group of, in, uh, in Washington, D.C. Uh, John Ball, who's a linguist at the University of Washington St. Louis, talks about variation. And variation is the idea that I can communicate through a diversity of phrases and say the, the exact same thing. Right? I can say, how are you doing? Do you feel okay? I can say, how you doing? Do you feel okay? I can say, hey, how are you doing? Are you feeling okay? Right? Is the words are very similar, but intonation, pace, tone, the accents, there's variation. That is to say, one message, different versions of that message can be interpreted very differently. What Fordham said, what if I have great pride in the way that I communicate? Then instead of using someone else's discourse in classrooms, which we ask students to do all the time, students are going to have to learn to, to lease. I'm going to use it for a while, but I'm going to Give it back. As soon as I leave the academic environment, I'm not going to speak in that particular way. She, she talked about this notion of fictive kinship, this idea that there's an imagined relationship among groups of people, particularly uh, black and brown students. That is to say that well, all Mexican-American people should sound this way. Or, or similarly, all African-Americans should sound this way. And because of this notion of a fictive kinship, students are in the position of either sounding academic or sounding black. Right? There is this tension that she talks about. All right, so what does this mean for teaching and learning? Now, when I, when I started my, my graduate career, uh, was, I was a teacher in Long Beach. Um, I didn't really care about students feeling comfortable, quite honestly. Right? My concern was that students didn't want to participate in classroom, classroom space because of the norms of the environment that I was establishing. Right? So the question for me is, what does it mean for teaching and learning? So I'm going to offer a, a couple of things. First thing is that language norms to racial identity. I want to just offer that as, as a fundamental Assumption. This whole presentation falls apart if we don't if we don't agree on that. So I'm not going to ask you to agree. I'm just going to say, do me a favor and agree that <laughs> we're, this is where we're going to go for the next few minutes, right? Language norms cue racial identity. So you can hear a person and say that does not sound like I, how I expect a particular person from a particular background to sound, right? All right. So the first six years of my career, I did nothing but social linguistic research to explore this idea and the ideas that discursive identity. How language cues our interpretation of both who people are and how people cue tacitly or implicitly who they want others to be is this notion of discursive identity, that we have an identity as communicators. So for example, I'm speaking rapidly because I have a 5.30 <laughs> departure time, right? But I'm also trying to maintain an academic tone, right? I'm, I'm choosing to communicate in a way that will establish myself as a professor, right? I'm, hopefully I'm still professorial. I might d dive in and out of that from time to time. But I am intentionally communicating in a way that fits the genre, I think. Right? The question is, who controls the language norms of the classroom? We don't have a class that teaches teachers how to establish language norms in classrooms generally. Some progressive universities do. But it tends to be a tacit part of every academic environment. Maybe a unit on, uh, when I say a unit, one session on how we establish ways of communicating and talking in classrooms. So why does this matter? Got a long way to go, short time to get there. 
Right, so science in my particular areas, I was, I was a science teacher, I study science, is a critical rich point, right? Because science courses have, in some cases, more new words, um, <clears throat> more new words than foreign language courses. It's a study by Alberman in 1989, basically says this, that there are new, more new science words in introductory level biology class than there were in an introductory level Spanish class. So just by the volume of language, right, alone, we're talking about a, a, an acquisition of a new language, right? Can teachers understand the genius of their students when language norms are different than their experience? Let me say this. We, when kids come to a room, do we, this is not a rhetorical question, do we expect them to know the information or do we not expect them to know the information? When they show up? We do not, know. We do not expect them to know. Teachers tend to play this game called guess what's in my head. They'll ask them an <laughs> academic term. Well, tell me about photosynthesis. And what they want to hear is a scientific, excuse me, is a response communicated in scientific discourse, right? My argument is that I would expect students to know a lot about photosynthesis, but not, perhaps not in the academic genre of science, right? Therefore, if we don't establish explicit language norms, what we're allowing language norms to do is make student content invisible and also create a pressure around the use of academic discourse. All right, so let me give you a quick example, and I want you to listen carefully to what he said. This is Romero. Tell me, can you, can you do me a favor and tell me some of the things that plants need to grow? Mm -hmm. Plants need, need to grow the copper dioxide, copper dioxide that humans breathe out and it's out and it goes to the, it turns into the stomata that, that has a cell, that has a green cells in, inside the leaves. Okay, so you said this carbon dioxide, and you also said something about the stomata. What, what, what is this stomata? Where is this stomata? Stomata, stomata is in the leaves that that the humans the humans put on the side, and then it so the leaves help it grow to make it glucose. Glucose, okay. And and where? How does the the plant take in the the air that you just breathe out. Carbon dioxide is important to the to the plants to help the plant need to grow up. Yeah, and are there any other things that the plant needs to grow? Like like ponds. Like like so a pond would that be the type of water? That will be the sunlight like, so to help it, to help it grow. I know what the water bill is. It's a it's a nice heat up so we can make a food type of thing to make it grow like some vegetables and fruits. Okay, and, and the chloroplast, where is the chloroplast located? Located to to inside the leaves. Inside the if you see on the microscope, because I saw it, I saw in a microscope was the tomato field is inside the leaves. Interesting, interesting. Okay. I'm showing this just to, to provide with some evidence of the complexity of the science language learning that this young man has to do. Right? You can hear it in his accent. He is also a second language learner. Right? The bolder terms, these are academic terms, new content terms that he needs to know. Carbon dioxide, which he says twice. The green cells is a reference to chloroplasts, which he doesn't produce the academic term for, but he seems to have some understanding of. Right? He also uses the term stomata, uses it accurately. Carbon dioxide, uses it accurately. Right? Also, chlorophyll, chloroplast, he then comes back and uses it later after it was used by the researcher, I believe. Now, what's interesting to me is that this learning experience, learning this level of academic discourse, is embedded in every fifth grade. This is actually a fifth grade lesson in a local East Bay classroom. Every fifth grade student has to engage in this level of language. Two things I want to offer. First, classroom management in urban schools is get the kids to sit down and be quiet, which will fundamentally prevent anyone from learning a new language. Imagine going to your French class and the teacher says, sit and listen. I'll talk to you about French. The one thing you learn is that the teacher knows a lot of French, right? <laughs> Until people are able to communicate themselves in the language that were required them to learn, how will they ever learn? Well, simple point here. The learning, academic language learning in science is a dense endeavor, right? Also not news to science educators, 
right? So the, the learning, learning the language science is a central component, component of learning science. I have two fundamental principles. The first is that it is not a neutral medium. So I have kids who live at a university whose father is a science education professor. It's probably a lot easier for them to use academic discourse because of the culture that they experience. They've heard me give this talk, right? So would that be the same for a kid in a local community where his identity, his linguistic identity is connected to how he sounds or how she sounds, right? It's not a neutral endeavor, right? Language learning by process is multimodal, so I'm gonna talk about that quickly. So here's what I mean by multimodal. One, we have to learn new words, right? Two, we have to learn new symbol systems, right? Now, for, for many, I usually, on the whiteboard, write this, the symbol triangle T. Anybody know what the symbol triangle T is? What is it? Let me hear it. Change, change the temperature. We're so thoroughly brainwashed that most of us see a triangle and a T, we go, oh, that's the change of temperature, right? Delta tau, could be a, no, no, could be a sorority or fraternity, right? But we, in scientific paradigms, see it fundamentally as change in temperature, right? So we do learn these new simple systems. Alternative meanings for vernacular terms. My mom forced me to eat vegetables last night. It has nothing to do with math nor acceleration, but she forced me to eat vegetables, right? Mathematical representations of concepts. And so we add new symbol systems to help us understand concepts as well. It's, language is complicated. And lastly, focus use of graphical representation. Right? We learn how to represent ideas through graphics. And so if it sounds like I'm selling a product, I, I, I pretty much am. Right? <laughs> so I think we're convinced. Learning science, language is complicated. So the question is, how do teachers do it? I'm sure teachers are aware of this, right? It's not news to teachers. So what do teachers do to help students learn the language of science? Now, I am completely setting up a straw man, right? I, am, I, I, I certainly understand that not all teachers do the same thing, but these are some things that I see. Word walks, right? One of the things that just hurts me to, the, to, to, to my soul, right? Because having the words on the wall is how we acquire new language, right? You were in Spanish class, imagine the words are just on the wall. That doesn't help you learn it, right? There's one simple thing. If I, if I speak the language, I'll know the language, right? So word walls is one of the things that we use. Fill in the bricks. Fill in the blank sentences. Word searches, right? Uh, introduction of root words and prefixes, especially in high school settings where teachers with great intention to help students understand, they want to teach students how to understand the roots and, and suffixes. So if it ends in ace, it is an enzyme, right? Now these are interesting, but what they fundamentally fail to do is put kids in a position where they can acquire a new language. Right, so this presents a few problems. The first is, new language, when languages are not learned, they are acquired. Foreign language teachers understand this. We understand this. If we want to learn a new language, we go immerse ourselves in a community where we're required to use a language. If we go back to my, my statement around classroom management, classroom management does the inverse of this in general, particularly in urban settings, is we say to the kids, sit down and be quiet, which prevents you from gaining and mastering academic discourse, right? Those who speak the language are those who will become fluent. Therefore, in order to put kids in situation, we need to put them in situations where, where they're required to make an explanation, and they're also required to make that explanation in science discourse. Right? <clears throat> this is the University of, of Jean Lay. Right? Situated language learning is customary. Right? Situated science language is customary in second language courses, and why not in science courses? And so the, the basic argument for me is that we're, we're relatively unsophisticated in our approach to teaching academic language despite the fact that academic language learning in science is highly complicated. And last but not least, without a specific and informed academic language learning approach, how do students learn and feel about, actively, about learning in science, right? So two things here, how do they learn if we don't have an, a, a, an a academic language approach that matches what we know about academic language learning? And conversely, how do students feel about having to adopt this complex academic discourse? And so that brings me to theoretical frameworks, very simple. The language learning, the language identity learning dilemma, which is has two fundamental components. The first is there's a cognitive component. That is to say, the words that we use help people understand phenomena. Right? And then second is an affect. The words that we use also sit in subtext. That subtext is who I am. And so similarly, when I offer new ideas in complex language, I'm, I'm not allowing students to understand. Right? So if I give you a new idea, but I give you that new idea in new language, I'm limiting your capacity to understand it. The second is I don't feel comfortable. If I berate you with complex academic terminology, you can make people feel uncomfortable with the environment that they're in. And finally, a failure to be understood. Uh, excuse me, I'm just A failure to understand and also a failure to be understood. 
if teachers then expect <coughs> students to communicate in academic language, right, then they won't hear the brilliance that's in, in students' communication. Right? The idea that I would come to an environment where I'm supposed to learn something and use the language of that environment is, is antithetical to the way that we understand things. So if I'm talking about engines at home and I learn a little bit of physics from talking about engines, then I'm going to communicate in the language of home because that's the language that I learned in. And so I wouldn't show up to the classroom communicating in academic language, right? However, our teachers are teachers prepared to hear students' communications in, in complex science language or everyday language. All right, so the last bit, and then we're going we're to go on to some studies, is language and conceptualization are connected. So the, the idea is when I offer an idea, the whole point of me offering an idea is so that you will understand. Right? I select words, and the words that I select are selected so that you will understand. So I, I came across this quote from Vygotsky. He says, in learning a new language, one does not return to the immediate world of objects, and does not repeat past linguistic developments, but uses instead the native language as a mediator between the world of objects and the new language. Right. That is to say, they return to the native language as a fundamental translation device. And so if I offer you a new idea, but I offer it to you in language that you don't understand, I have not provided you with that fundamental mediating device. If I want you to understand, I should introduce it in a language that you surely will understand, and then add the language so that you can mediate between the two. Similarly, I'm going to take a perspective from <clears throat> from Ajay Sharma and Andy Anderson. And they describe the frameworks, and think of it as a pyramid. And their simple argument is this. We have millions of experiences, which through these experiences, we see thousands of patterns, which we reduce then to a small number of explanations. So as we go through the world, I get close to a heat producing object. I learn as a baby, you know, it's hot, so I need to move away, right? Then I learn the closer I am to a heat producing object, the greater the temperature, right? Closer I am to a heat producing object, the greater the temperature. I develop a pattern, I develop an understanding, and I develop an explanation. Now for me this is powerful because what language and what cultural language practices will that explanation be embedded in? Right? I probably will not use scientific language unless the culture that I learned it in was scientific language. And this goes back to the, the cognitive side of the language identity dilemma. Right? If I learn it in the language of the culture that it's embedded in, but the teacher is listening for academic language, can the teacher hear me? It's a failure to be understood and a failure to understand, right? And so for, for me, as we go through the world, we'll develop explanations of patterns and things that we recognize, but that explanation should be in the language of the culture where we work. <coughs> okay. So using, you, using these principles and structures to accomplish two primary tasks. The first thing is I, I'm of the opinion that we should provide students with initial intuitive language to serve as a media. Now, this is poorly typed. I sh we shouldn't provide students with initial language. We should identify through pre-assessment what language resources that they have and then teach them the fundamental ideas best we can in fundamental everyday language and then explicitly teach them science language. All right? Now, because language is situated, language learning is situated according to second language learning teachers like Lindy S. Roscoe, then we need to situate language learning in meaningful context. That is to say, I need them to explain the phenomenon and ask them to use the language of instruction, or excuse me, the, the academic language as they explain the phenomenon. And by situating language learning, requiring them to make an explanation, I can create an authentic opportunity for them to become language masters. All right. so there's the theoretical framework. We're done. We're done. So I'm just going to introduce you to some very brief studies and, and, and have time to talk. And so, um, I'm going to start with a very simple research question. Right? So how does the use of what we're calling this aggregate instruction compare with a more aggregate alternative? And so what I mean by this aggregate instruction is separating the instruction from conceptual component and the linguistic component. Instead of doing both simultaneously, let's go back to this Vygotskyan uh, <coughs> go back to this, uh, this Vygotskyan notion of offering them a mediation device. I'm going to start with everyday language first so that I'm sure that they understand, and then once they understand, I'll teach them explicitly the science languages. So a uh, couple of years ago, we did this quasi-experimental quasi study where we did a very simple pre and post test design. So we had an experimental group, a control group, um, <clears throat> very simple. One group was taught using everyday science language. The other group was taught using 
explicit science language. So let me kind of explain what that looks like. Um, before I move on, just so that uh, the first time I did it with, did, did it with uh, one of your former uh, postdocs, Keon Ryu, where we set up a computer environment and then we we created two versions of the software. The only condition we changed was the language use of that software, um, which is which worked phenomenally well. I, I was concerned it didn't translate to teachers, right? Where the rubber meets the road is when teachers teach using a particular method, and so um, that's when you go into the rabbit hole, right? There's a reason why we don't do teacher studies very often, right? Because you have to have the teacher teacher fidelity is a huge issue, and so what you're seeing is just a pilot study. So I want to talk to you about things we did to try to manage for teacher fidelity. First is scripted lessons. Right? We wanted to make sure that we can keep all things equal as much as we could. So we had two different lessons with, with the exact same kind of things. Right? So scripted lessons, we made sure teachers were using the same type of language. Equal time on task. Very explicit agendas to make sure that teachers were teaching according to the time frameworks. Ethical materials. Every, every set of materials had to be the same. And then identical instructional activities. So let me give you kind of a look at what that would look like. So for example, um, parallel text types. You see this is a chemistry, high school chemistry lesson done in East Palo Alto where one group got a reading about valence, the other group got a reading about the outer layer of electrons. One group got something about the octet rule, the other one got the rule of eight and the rule of two. Right? The other group got electronegativity, the other group got the power to pull electrons. And so just offering as best we could everyday alternatives to science ideas. Another example, um, we, we're asking them also, because we're trying to situate language, right? Give them opportunities to explain. Well, in the control group, we gave them only science explanations. So after you read, write the explanation to valence, right? The other group, after you read this, write the explanation to the outer layer of electrons. And so we started with science language and ended with each group using science language. So the, the subsidies are very, very small. So two teachers in this work. The first is Mr. Song, second is Mr. Anderson. We had them alternate their teaching methods. Now, there was a, <clears throat> this pub, I'll probably never publish this paper because half of the teachers quit uh, before we could finish the paper process, right? So we only got, of the entire sample, we had eight teachers teaching, we only had two finish both, both sets of data, which is, which is the reality of doing inner city teaching research. I wouldn't recommend it. <laughs> All right, so simple numbers. So pretest, so we, we to, to, to provide uh, an oriented pretest measure, we gave them uh, an assessment. I did, forgot to tell you about the assessment. So I take I took free release NAPE items. So NAPE, NAPE provides you online with uh, assessment items that you can use that use on past NAPE tests. And so we use these pre-release NAPE, NAPE items, give them pre and post versions, so that we can see gain. So, for example, the means of 15.71 for the control group, uh, treatment group 15.00, so you can see that in the pretest, the control group scored better. Uh, Post-test, 29.92 was the mean score versus 34.14 for the treatment condition. Gain, so the percent gain for both groups, 18.94 for the control group and 25.52 for the experimental group. We also did something called a normalized game, which I'll explain, but these were statistically significant. I'm very, very excited about this until I found out that uh, I didn't have all the data because not all the teachers did the pre and the post, right? So for me, this is the third experiment that we run of this kind, documenting that students learn better when being taught with everyday language, all right? So I want to explain game. So let's say I score 80 on the first test. I'm going to have 20% 20, 20 to improve on the post test, right? Another student scores 40. They have 60% to improve. And so to account for the amount of gain which is possible, we use a measure called, uh, <clears throat> called normalized gain. And so it's just the, the post-test measure minus the pretest, minus the difference between what you're capable of, of changing, right? So it gives us a more authentic measure of how much gain is possible. And so comparing those measures, again, the, the, on the left is the control group. The, the smaller number is the regular gain percentage or gain means. And the bigger one is the, the, uh, the normalized gain. And so what, what we see here is in the control group, the difference is uh, 6.58 points, meaning that if you, if you account for the normalized gain, you'll see 6% improvement right, versus another 8% for the experimental group. And so what we're seeing is that consistently, I've done this 
this is three, four, three experiments I've done over the last seven years of my career, is content learning is, is improved each and every time. So the next question for me was, is there an eff effective domain? Right? Can I document how students feel about the language? And for me, uh, mind you, I started as a social linguist. I'm still a social linguist, believe it or not. I ended up doing classroom experiments. I'm not quite sure how I, how I got here. And I will go back to social linguistic research as soon as my questions come back that direction. But I was concerned about how can I measure how students feel? So just so happened my next door neighbor is a psychologist, you know, my, my sweet mate. So I asked him, well, what can we do? So we decided to, to focus on working memory capacity. All right, simple, right? The reason why we don't remember phone numbers, you remember you used to, if I could say, hey, what's Bob's phone number? You can say, oh, it's 510-638-4675, right? Is we don't do that anymore because the cell phones have destroyed our need to store that information, right? That it went, if you don't punch that number in, right, you won't remember it. And so we, since we never punch numbers anymore, right, our, our working memory capacity has allowed us to forget those phone numbers. And so we really only retain very little. Now, <coughs> under stress, what we know is working memory capacity is limited. So there are a couple of tests I'd like to show you. The first is the Stroop test, which you've seen, which is a, a test of working memory capacity, right? So if the word red is written in blue, you mark the B button. But if it, the word red is written in red, you mark the R button, right? Similarly, the flanker test. These are both psychological measures developed in the 70s. So if I offer a flanker test, you need to identify the arrow in the middle. The direction that is pointing is the direction that you push on your keyboard, right? Here's an alternative. No, this one is going the opposite direction. Now, again, this is a, it's a, it's a measure of working memory capacity. There's two types of measures. There's a congruent measure and an incongruent measure. So here's what a congruent measure is. Congruent measure is when, the, when they match. So when red is written in red, it's congruent. When red is written in blue, it's incongruent. That means what I'm, I'm getting two messages versus one. Does, does that make sense? Which, which is to say it's more cognitively challenging to recognize them when they're incongruent. Similarly, when all the arrows are going in one direction, it is congruent versus when one is pointed in another direction, it is incongruent, right? So, take a look at these numbers. So this summer, I had a group of 70 kids. I set up computer, computer simulations. I recorded a video. The video had, the images were exactly the same. Time on task, exactly the same. The only difference was whether or not the explanation was in everyday language or in science language. So, Control group, true congruent. So when they're recognizing the colors, we'll see that the control group, these are percentage, I'm sorry, no, this is, uh, <clears throat> this, this is uh, milliseconds, right? The milliseconds response, you'll see that 94.7 versus 94.1, is that the control group is just a bit slower. Milliseconds for, and that's incongruent, for, this is for congruent. Uh, 1,193. I, I believe this is an error, though. I think those are percentages. 1193.04 uh, for these for the Stroop congruent versus 11.03 for the experimental group, right? So the experimental condition, just slightly faster. Percentage, what I want you to really note, 93.5% versus 93.4, is there's really no difference in percentage of accuracy. So this is how accurate are they? So both groups are accurate about the same, but what's different is the time that it takes the groups to actually engage in this task. You take a look at cell D here, 95.46% correct versus 96.6, so experimental group slightly is correct, but again, these, these, the differences in accuracy are very small. Uh, mean group, so again, this is when the flanker test, when the arrow congruent is pointed the same direction, 974.55 milliseconds versus 650.27 milliseconds, what we're seeing is that the experimental group is quite a bit faster in recognizing, and again, when it's incongruent, the cognitive task is more difficult. And the last one is the flanker incongruent. Uh, here's a better way to rep similarly. This was our biggest difference and was statistically significant. I'll show you the p-values in a second. But again, when the flanker arrows were pointed the opposite directions, we had our biggest difference across groups. So here's a better representation. Right, so the control group is offered the science discourse experimental group. And what, what was really most profound to us is that in this particular condition, when they're engaged in recognizing the arrow direction, that the complication of that task was much more significant for those in our control group. It was much more difficult when they got academic life. So for us, simple message, across all measures, when asked to engage in this cognitive task, right, students Ability and speed in which they did it was slowed down for every particular test. 
right? When the measures were incongruent, when the, the task became more difficult, we noticed that it was that the students in the control group were slower uniformly, and it was statistically significant p value of what's my p value here? 0.005, so it's a very strong, strongly significant value. So this is pretty shocking for us, but moving forward, what it does is lead credence to something, is that the thing that we feel about how complex language, how it impacts us, can be assessed, right? Not only do students learn better, but you can document that using complex language fundamentally reduces students' working memory capacity in ways that are accessible, right? So, so what's the point? So for me, disaggregating instruction and thinking about how language can be used better, how we can explicitly teach the language of science is a critical part of student learning. But more importantly, that we can then also document that students are feeling a particular way. There is an affective domain to academic discourse that has to be assessed. Right? So I'm looking forward to, to continuing this line of work and set up several iterations of this work. We've now developed iPad software to bring this into digital textbooks to see as we move towards digital textbooks, are we using what we know about how language impacts students' learning and their sense of self to produce better student learning in the digital domain as well. All right, thank you for your time. <laughs> Questions, thoughts? Yes, sir. Yeah, I'm wondering, um, I did some research work for ETS before I got out of here. Just wondering what uh, has been done in this space um, with regards to like standardized tests and instructions. I, I, don't, I couldn't tell you, I have no idea. Uh, again, I'm, this is about as far away from my expertise as I can get as a social linguist uh, by training. Um, so I absolutely don't know. Yeah. I was wondering, when you did an experiment, you had the two um, different um, languages for the chemistry curriculum. And I was wondering, um, you So um, we just re we just rewrote them okay. and, and kept the word count exactly the same. Okay. So what you do is say, okay, what's another way to say electronegativity? Then we would say, okay, the way to do it is you say um, pulling electrons. It's an easier version, right? You take that and then you you do the word you do the word count to make sure the word count is the same. And then there's this online software. I can't remember the name of it, but you can put it just cut and paste it so you can get the grade level. So we wanted to keep the grade level as close as possible. Right. Once you take the, the, the length of the word out, it automatically increases the grade level. So that was one of the things we couldn't control for. Because easier language tends to be a lower grade level. So does that mean there are like universal language resources out there available like at like I don't know. I mean I, I do know that you can do you can do word count online where you can adjust it's a teacher tool when they what if you take a text and cut and paste and drop it in, you can then reduce the reading level so it's more manageable for the students. And we found that I don't know the name of it. You just go with it. I, was, um, I probably missed this on the screen. I was looking at the pre-test means of uh, both groups of teachers. Uh, were both teachers very similar in terms of the years of experience teaching? Both were second year teachers. Okay. So, and this is the issue of teacher fidelity, right? Mm -hmm. Is it, ideally, to do a thorough experiment, like I knew what I was doing, I would do, you do 50 teachers, right? You get, a, you get the bigger end, and then you control for type, and then I can do correlations between teacher experience an outcome to see how much that mattered completely out of my the scope of, uh, of this particular project, but yeah, point well taken. So in this aggregated instruction, it seems like the first step is teaching these concepts in simple ways without the that scientific vocabulary. And then you were talking about the second step being to introduce that vocabulary in a more authentic way. I was wondering if you could elaborate on that Absolutely. process. Absolutely. Uh, so if I'm teaching a lesson, um, on, I did one to a science camp on Saturday, and it was the story of Miley Cyrus, Cyrus's digestive issues. You know, that's why she was acting crazy, because she had some digestive problems, right? <laughs> so the lesson was on the digestive system. And so they had to do two things. They needed to write a letter and explain how each part of the digestive system could have potentially failed her, what, what could have been the problem. And they had to use words like esophagus. They had to use words like digestive system, kind, small intestine, large intestine. But here was the key. They knew the idea first, and then we taught them what the word was. It's just an alternative for the word. So the, the, the simple, and I'm not selling this aggregate instruction as a solution. It's just what we tried. Right? The idea is, if we don't have an approach that separates 
language and cognition, then we're allowing it to be a subtext of students learning. And students may not know why they're uncomfortable. So for me, the big idea is give them an idea and then create opportunities in your formative assessment where they're required to explain, and they know I'm supposed to be explaining using science language, and that's how they learn the language. I guess I'm just going to ask you to repeat or say in a different way uh, the, the logic of the, of the strip study. Um, yes. You said something about something about working memory. You said, also said something about um, uh, engagement or uh, so. Um, standard ways of doing working memory or like backward digit span or something right. like that. I don't I don't see the connection of working memory it's to tough. the strip so, test. So let me divulge that Dr. Pesesi. This is one of my uh, Spencer mentors, so I knew I was going to get a tough question. Um, <laughs> I should have asked you first. So I went to the psychologist and said, well, what can we do to measure stress? And then we said, well, we're not sure that stress is what's being produced. Right? But, but it's a, it is an emotive feeling. You notice like, I go back and forth between affective and emotive. And so we had a couple options. The primary option was cortisol. You can do a cortisol measure, production of the cortisol enzyme in saliva. Cost effectiveness, not, not so great. Right? So what we know about both the Stroop and the Flank measure is any, any entrance of stress or distraction limits your capacity to <coughs> engage in this task because it's, it's, it's the fundamental text, excuse me, the fundamental assumption of this particular test is that it's based on working memory capacity. So if you can stress a person, you will reduce this working memory capacity. So I cannot claim that we stress them. I can claim that all things were exactly the same except for the language use. So the language use has an implication on working memory capacity. And so I'm trying to figure out how to phrase that. So there is an emotive impact of some sort. And I have to use very, very soft language because I'm not sure if it's, I can't say it's stress. Right. Yes, sir. When was the, uh, excuse me, when was the working memory uh, exam given to the students? It was, it was literally embedded in the test. So they, 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 took, they took some questions, you know, your name, your background, they watched the video. The next screen that popped up was the, was the, was the test. So it happened immediately after the video. Other questions? Brian, this is so fascinating, and I remember Kelly telling me about um, the early work. Um, and I guess I'm curious, um, from a from the standpoint of sort of building new uh, instructional materials that are going to be used widely. What are some of the recommendations that you would give to designers? I love that question. From you, I love that question. <laughs> so I'm excited about this. Um, I'm imagining what, what, and this is what, this is the study we want to do. If, if the face matters of the person communicating, right? If the tone of voice matters of the person communicating, I think the next set of studies I'd like to see is in the digital space. And so we're we're working with uh, iPads right now. I'd like to alter the voice of the people we're speaking. Um, so just for example, if the student, I can record students using the, the voices of the community making an explanation. And I'm curious how that would impact the student's understanding of the concept and any affective domain response, right? So mm -hmm. for example, we, if you look at a lot of cartoon characters, I have a graduate student now who's looking at cartoon representations in digital media. And what he found is all the, the, well, the majority of the, the criteria and the characteristics are white European characteristics, and so green eyes, blonde hair, things of that nature. So the question is, could we alter the representation by voice, by language practices, to produce greater learning outcomes? And so again, I'm less concerned about people feel, how people feel and more concerned about how they learn. And so for me, I would argue is if language learning is critical, I'd like to see embedded formative assessment where we require students to use the language in the digital realm to produce learning. Right? And secondly, I like to see images that give them a, a sense of comfort. And so that the immediate images that they see are ones that reflect them. I'd like to see them even build their own meme in some way, right? Build their own icon, and that icon speaks back. And so um, I think we're so early on in this particular digital media age that we don't know the impact of those. So I'd like to see that studied in that way.
Any last questions? I appreciate your time. I'll make it back. Isn't that great? <laughs>